Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. And let me turn our attention to Tom. Let me introduce him briefly. First of all, um, he is a THM Master of Theology grad. You majored in? Biblical Exposition. Biblical Exposition. But you love the Old Testament, right? I, I mean, you, be, you, you almost became a, like a Hebrew almost. guy. But I had a Greek professor. Yeah, it's true. Named yeah. Dr. Daryl Bach, yeah. who constantly reminded me of always observing the Greek text. But I also observe the Hebrew text. That's right. Nothing beats observing the, the Greek, Greek text. text. Nothing, 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 nothing at all. Yes. Okay. I heard that many times. I heard that in my sleep. <laughs> I still hear that in my sleep. It's called PTSD. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's not. It's not. <laughs> I love and appreciate you. Guys. Yeah, so. I'm teasing. Um, he, uh, he pastors in Kansas City at Christ Community Church. Um, more importantly for us today, he is... Um, he runs as president of Made to Flourish, which is a nationwide pastors network for, uh, for the common good and dealing with what we're going to be talking about today, which is kind of what we're calling whole life discipleship. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about the role of faith and work. And really, the topic is, how do I prepare pastors to think, how I say it this way, less about Sunday and more about Monday? Okay. So that's our topic. And is, is, as is our tradition that you now have become used to, we have the microphones here. You can walk up and ask questions, or you can text them in on the number that's on the screen. And we'll be doing that in oh, about uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. So, uh, so let me get started. Um, let's talk about this whole life discipleship, and I'm going to have some fun. Um, there are holes in the way the church teaches and preaches, which whole life discipleship is designed to fill. Fill in the blanks. That's a lot of holes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, just a couple of things. First of all, thank you for the privilege of being here today and uh, for Dallas Seminary. I'm grateful for Dallas's investment in me and uh, the tools I got here, I cherish. Um, yeah, when, when we think about the holes, there are holes. And so I would say very briefly my own story. Can I just be yeah, for go ahead. being self-absorbed? Sure. But yeah. most people ask me. I've had the joy of serving a congregation now for 30 years. And on a good Sunday, it began with two of us in an apartment. So when I left Dallas Seminary, we moved to Kansas City, my bride and I, and uh, we had been with crew and led crew ministry at SMU and other places. And so um, loved God's word, taught it, uh, taught it well, but I came to the conviction out of um, a theological uh, reflection that um, I was really not discipling people for the majority of their life. Uh, I call it the majority and minority disparity, that my emphasis as a pastor was really how well I did on Sunday. And again, as I say always, Sunday matters. If you're a pastor and leading God's char church that's gathered, you do that well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I realized that my framework about discipling or equipping the saints for the work of service mm -hmm. in Ephesians was deeply impoverished. And I'm not blaming my Greek professor or anybody else. I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, so all that to say is that I had to make some pretty major changes about 25 years ago and uh, realizing the holes, and I've used the language, you use sub-practice, I use malpractice, pastoral malpractice. Mm -hmm. So it, I've been on a journey to, out of theological and biblical conviction of the text to begin to align what I believe the text teaches from mm -hmm. canonically, creation to the maps, mm -hmm. um, of how important... Um, all of life is and how the gospel profoundly transforms okay let's define the, let's define the malpractice here because people may or may not understand it's what a little provocative uh, yeah so um, i've called it sub -practice, sub practice but that's okay um so what so what what exactly are we talking about what, so what yeah what what occurred for me and i trust that that's not for you uh i had not done enough time uh, I remember even Hebrew doing Ruth and Psalms, and this is not a critique in my curriculum, it's just like I needed more time in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Because as we've talked about, if we do not grasp the Torah, if we don't grasp the foundation of the story, the other pieces often are not coherent or rich and connected, the fabric of canonical text. So uh, I realized the more I studied, particularly the early chapters of Genesis, that I was I was missing some significant things, and we don't have time to unpack all that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I love the text and believe that every jot and tittle is inspired, right, in the original text. So 
I, the more I study through the early chapters of Genesis, I begin to realize, wow, I'm, I've been missing some really important things that profoundly are important in God's redemptive enterprise hmm. and my role in it as a pastor. So my paradigm of pastoral vocation was impoverished and it needed to be expanded. And that led me to the conviction, rereading the reformers like Luther and Calvin, rereading the Genesis text particularly, and then beginning to see all the connections all the way through the, the canon, uh, that my equipping the saints for service, my equipping calling was not just to help them be a good Sunday Christian, but to truly equip them for their Monday worlds, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And transparently, I, our, our passion, preaching, language, benedictions, our Sunday, our mission, our priorities, our budget, all of that was not deeply aligned with that. Mm -hmm. And I had to realign it. For example, one, and, and Eugene Peterson uses this language, but for one thing, I, there's certain language. Languages are the artificial, are artifact of culture. They mm -hmm. carry our values. And, and I don't mean this uncharitable, but I grew up hearing the word full-time Christian ministry. And I understand the meaning of that. It's not to diminish that. But what that often is heard by those who hear it who are not in full-time ministry is that I'm less important. So there are language changes I begin to make that I thought were more integral. So our language and culture begin to change, our pathways of discipleship begin to change, and uh, pastoral praxis begin to change. Preaching, we can talk more about illustrations, what I read, and one of the classic examples, when I, 30 years ago when I began in a pastoral role, I made hospital visits. And I deeply believe in that today, mm. to care for my parishioners. But I had no framework theologically, or missionally, or vocationally why a workplace visit mattered so much to disciple my people mm. and that that's one example and i'll stop there we so, have, yeah like, so, like workplace so, visits now are part so, of our praxis so, so part of the point here is is that um uh, the premise most of the people in your audience spend the bulk of their productive life in work from eight or nine to five, apparently, depending on where you live in the country. And paid or unpaid. That's cause, right. Because work is contribution, biblically, That's right. not just compensation. That's so, right. Yeah. So Define it right. But they, but they are in this slot. And then if you think about the preaching that you hear, how much of the preaching that you hear actually addresses that slot of a person's life? Yeah. And I remember one of my greatest memories since I'm home uh, mm -hmm. is John Stott did a lecture here, and I uh, had the joy, of, only had five of us that had lunch with him. It was almost like two hours with John Stott. Mm -hmm. But John Stott's work of Between Two Worlds is mm -hmm. really that, right? All Taking right. God's timeless truth and applying it and connecting it without reductionism mm -hmm. to that cultural context is our stewardship. But that world, right? I understood a little, and I'm still unlearning and learning the biblical text, mm -hmm. right? This is a never ending. But the context of my listeners was deeply reductionistic and impoverished. I did not focus on their world, mm -hmm. which is the majority of time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yes, I touched on relationships that mattered, but I just didn't have the understanding of preaching, teaching, praying, equipping them for their world. I was between two worlds, but one world was deeply shriveled. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, sub, sub practice. <laughs> However you want to say it, boss. <laughs> so, so I, yeah. So I think I'm, with God's grace, as a pastor, becoming more integral, faithful, and fruitful in what I do now than what I, how I approached my vocation 30 years ago. So whole life discipleship then is the idea of when I teach and preach, mm -hmm. I need to be addressing and speaking into every space and place that a person lives in. Correct, because I think if we have a rich creation theology, mm -hmm. we have a richer redemption theology and a richer consummation theology. Mm -hmm. So I do want to have a deep understanding of the value of the moment now, the embodied, incarnational, temporal reality now, not to minimize the future. So if I do have that conviction, theologically, biblically, then I'm unpacking, making the connection of the sacred text and the gospel, how it speaks into that nook and cranny, that that nook and cranny matters, that the gospel speaks into that moment. To God that has you there for a reason. Yeah, to that, and his presence, the empowerment of the spirit, the role of being filled with the spirit and walking in the spirit is not reductionistic. Mm -hmm. It's profoundly pervasive, moment by moment, as for example, in the workplace, what does it mean to take your soul to work? Mm -hmm. As 
Paul Stevens has written a book, or what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit, or walk in the Spirit in that workplace where the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light collide, mm -hmm. right? Where sin is evident, right? Mm -hmm. The brokenness of Genesis 3. So I'm just saying the richness of theology, I cannot emphasize the value of what we're doing here is unpacking the biblical text, learning it, deepening it, but then applying it to a cultural context, which is what the Hendricks Center is doing so well. Mm -hmm. But that's, that has to be a great translation enterprise. Okay, so let's let's do a uh, theological snapshot here on okay. Genesis one and two. Let's do that. Um, what uh, what what is at the core of understanding the value of work? Because when some people hear faith and work, they say, "Oh, we we're talking about doing evangelism at work." Okay, which is a part of what we're talking about, but sure. that's not the major part of what we're talking about. So let's fill in that gap. So can we just have a moment in the text? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just saying the application, I know we want to go there, and yeah. it's really important, but um, what drives me on my knees before a holy God is the sacred text that I work through. Mm -hmm. But when we look at Genesis, there's much we could say. Eugene Peterson, I think, has said it perhaps the best, that fundamentally, the early chapters of Genesis are a journal of work. Hmm. Now, there are theological and exegetical reasons for that, because God introduces himself as a worker. We hear bara, right? Mm -hmm. God creates. God is a worker. Yeah, he now, was God, busy on... God could introduce himself. He was busy I mean, creating. In special revelation, God, there's so much of God that's inexhaustible. He could have unveiled, you know, uh, much about himself before he even got to what he did. Can I mm -hmm. use that dichotomous mm -hmm. language? <clears throat> so God is a worker, and that's significant that bara frames the Torah and the biblical text. But when you walk through, you see God's working in creation, right? Uh, and there's all kinds of, if you want, consonantal assonance going on and mm -hmm. all that, I think, in the Hebrew text where you hear these verbs echo. But uh, God creates, and then we hear God bless. And there's all kinds of dynamics with Baruch Baruch, mm -hmm. right? Blessing, blesses the birds and animals and blesses humans. Um, and he gives us, after the Imago Dei, with the Salem and Demuth, the likeness and image, which is a major category of human anthropology. Then, following 25, 26, 27, we have now 28. Mm -hmm. So I'm just simply to say, we can unpack two a lot, because they all go together, but 28, you have five Hebrew imperatives called the cultural mandate. We, I could say this, guy. We just ran into it at the, at the a library. It was odd. Dr. Richard Averbeck, mm -hmm. who is a a prophet Trinity, another good school, by the way. Um, and he's an Old <laughs> Got Testament. Got his doctorate there. <laughs> Old Testament prophet, prof, and we were just having this conversation briefly with him about the uniqueness of the five Hebrew imperatives stacked together. In English, it's be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. All that to say, there's so much here, but this language of fruitfulness and human job description that is built out in chapter two um, is that work is a very important part of the creation story. First of all, in imaging God, as I, th I think brilliantly said by John Kilner, is it's, this idea is connection and reflection. So connection we talked about is deeply relational. A Trinitarian God being an image bearer, we are deeply relational creatures. But we're also reflectional creatures. And a big part of the Hebrew text there is that we reflect God immediately in the context. We do it in many ways, as it's unveiled through progressive revelation, but it is work. I mean, if you just take the context of how the narrative builds, it's work. And how this builds out, in, also in chapter 2, because para is fruitfulness, it has both in Torah procreativity and productivity. And I don't want to get too dense here, but it's really important to understand that the narrative in Genesis is not just about having babies. That's the para of procreativity. That's be fill, you know, be fruitful, and then these four imperatives follow, and they accent both of the elements of, of para. Be fruitful, right? Para, be fruitful, then it says, what? Multiply, fill. Those two imperatives enhance para of procreativity. Right after that is have dominion and subdue it, which is the productive aspect. And, and Moses will use the language of fruit of the womb and fruit of the land. So my point is the fruitful language, being fruitful. And Rabbi Jesus will say, be, by this is my father glorified, by what? That you bear much fruit. When you follow this fruitfulness, it's a really important part of what it means to be human. So you're saying productive, not just in reproduction, but, but, in, but productive in the in work of our hands. Yeah. And then lastly, I would just say, just briefly, since you guys are, uh, this is a place of theology and biblical exegesis, I trust. <laughs> uh, I know it is. Um, is that you have the different Hebrew word in Genesis 2 
than Genesis 1. Genesis 1, you know, is bara. It's very loaded and unique, right? Three times mm -hmm. in, in the, in the uh, picture of the image of God in man. But then you have Yatsar. You have God forms the man from Shaping. dust. Yep. And you know that that is a delicate architectural design. So think about just practice. We are embodied creatures. Just think of your hands. We're talking about the free solo uh, Alex Hanel, who did El Capitan, but think of how God designed humans, embodied humans, designed them with something in mind. Think of your human brain, okay? What distinction, why did God do that? Why, why, is, why are we so powered for brain work, right? Or why do we have our hands like we do? Well, it's tied to our job description at 215. Hmm. So I'm just saying there's so much, it's not that we worship our work, that's very dangerous, right? It can be an idol. And there's a great Atlantic Monthly article by Tarek Thompson just out on workism. We don't worship our work. That's the danger of idolatry. Mm -hmm. But work is a vital part of our worship. It's an essential part of image bearing. And again, it all connects to me in terms of Jesus as a carpenter and how Paul unpacks it. But, but theology does matter here. It has to be a theological conviction. This is not like a little program, I'm gonna have a faith and work initiative. The point is, is that the biblical text leads us that work is really important. And I would suggest, however you understand the continuity, discontinuity of the now and the not yet, which Christian tradition has wrestled with, that I, I have more of a sense that Jesus taught more continuity. So the work we do now will have impact on the work we do later in the new heavens and new earth. And in fact, it pre in some senses, but it previews what's I think what so, and I think it brings more dignity. Even the work is now thorns and thistles. There's something really significant. So theology matters. And at the core of work is service. Uh, let me bring up another word. Thanks and, for letting us go there a little. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, the, the other key word here that I think uh, we have to think through is the word stewardship, that yeah. work is something that we steward. So let's, t let's talk about what that is, what's involved in that idea. So let's go back to the foundation again, because I, I mean, Dr. Bach, you've really championed this word, and mm -hmm. it's really important. Mm -hmm. And it's important not only in the New Testament, but it's framing as in the Old. So let's just take Genesis 2.15, these two Hebrew infinitives, to cultivate and to keep the garden. Um, that captures the human job description, avodah and shamara, of nurturing creation and culture and protecting it. Mm -hmm. So humans fit in the creator order as stewards, mm -hmm. not owners, because we are the created, mm -hmm. not the creator, right? And that's why the psalmist say, the earth is the Lord's and everything it contains. Mm -hmm. No question who owns it, right? Mm -hmm. Who designed it, who built it? They own it, right? Or he owns it, or how do we bring that tree in the Trinitarian framework? Right. But I'm saying I love that stewardship because it's more explicit in the New Testament, mm -hmm. right? The stewardship language mm -hmm. in parables and so forth. But it's woven into the foundation of the Genesis text in human anthropology that we fit in the created order. Notice also, if you want to look more carefully, you have a negation in two of there's no bush. Look how it frames, no bush, no spring, no plant, no rain, no man. And then notice the um, modification. Only place there, it's added to what? To avodah, to work the ground, okay? So I'm just saying the stewardship piece is woven into the very fabric pre-fall and it builds all the way through. Think of Jesus' parable. So I'm saying the stewardship language is explicit in the New Testament, but it's vital to see all of life as a stewardship that we will give an account for, right? Right. It's Jesus' parable. So, so the point here is, is that if we were asked the question, why is human, what is humankind designed to be and why does it exist? It's to steward the place where God has us well in mutual cooperation with one another. Image of God is male and female. Right. Right. And to work together, not in competition. And of course, what messes this up is Genesis 3, the fall, which I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on because I think we all know the effects of the fall and what that we means. We sure feel it every day, yeah, don't exactly we? right. So, so, but it doesn't change what we were designed to be. No, in fact, going back to the Genesis text again, if you just start there, you know, when they're sent out of the garden, right out of grace and all that mystery. The, the language of to work the ground continues, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And even Noah, the one who's going to bring favor or comfort in Genesis, is one who's going to relieve the work of our hands. Watch the text. So the work, the cultural mandate continues, even though it's corrupted. So I'm just saying even there, it's very, very evident. And the, and the work of Jesus is the work of restoring 
that capability that was originally designed. Yes. So we don't leave it even after we go through the process of salvation. Yeah, and, and when, again, just how I understand it, this uh, level of my understanding, uh, is that when Rabbi Jesus, who is Jesus the Savior, when he states brilliant statements, is the most brilliant being in John 10.10, 10, for example, the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy. He, he brings that contrast, right, of evil and the evil one. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That summary of the good, true, and beautiful life that is so deeply Stoic and Hebrew in the Sermon on the Mount is a picture of, we'd say, human flourishing, living life as God designed it in the fullness of embodied creation. So I just think that's the picture that we use the language salvation from, and that's really important. We must never forget that. We have been saved from eternal peril and death. The challenge for me is I also want to say, yes, that's foundational, but once we're saved from, right, the great justification text, <laughs> Tim talked about that last night, then we're saved for and we're saved to. So the idea of salvation biblically is profoundly transformational in all aspects of human experience. And reconnects us to those early chapters in Genesis and what we're creating. That's how I see it because I just, you know, the more I study scripture and pray and listen and read, I see such, not only, and here's, I'm gonna throw my bent. Systematic theology matters and it helps bring, at least how I see it, it brings logic, attempt to bring logical consistency to the whole canonical text, mm -hmm. and it matters. But what biblical theology does, if I may use that distinction, it brings canonical coherence. This is, you know, we've talked about mm -hmm. narratival or canonical, however you say it, because like, mm -hmm. you're the scholar. Mm -hmm. So canonical, and I, I love you for that. <laughs> the canonical coherence also matters. So my hermeneutical enterprise, and I'm using language because you're theologians here. Mm -hmm. The hermeneutical enterprise, I think, has to balance both of those intention. Jeremy Treat did a brilliant book called The Crucified King, where he brings kingdom and gospel language around the crucifixion. Both biblical theology and systematic theology mutually inform each other in a respectful way. So I'm saying the more I try to be an apprentice of Jesus and follow the biblical text, I have a greater, it's more important for me to also bring the whole canonical framework within that pericope or that section. So I think both are important, but I guess I want to raise also the importance of the biblical theology, how it fits into the canon. Um, and I think, again, if I believe in inspiration of the whole text and one author, ultimately the text, I think all the texts are important in that hermeneutical enterprise. Okay, let me come to one other idea and then we'll turn to questions. Um, human flourishing. One of those phrases that you hear a lot in this conversation, particularly when we think about work yeah. and, and how we function in culture, that kind of thing. And the first reaction people have is, well, where is that word in the Bible? Uh, I, don't, I, I can't think of the, uh, that specific term. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, obviously, in this conversation, it's an important landing place. So help us with that. How, how do we think about human flourishing and the, and the way it is expressed in Scripture? Okay, well, I would say a couple things. One is that I'm not sure, whether it's Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, there's, there's an exact correspondence to that English word. So I'll defer to some of those who spend every day focusing on that. Um, but the, the ideas of which <clears throat> the English idea of flourishing comprehensively are all over the scripture. Mm -hmm. Let me just take, I'll take three Hebrew words to start with. Let's just start okay. from the beginning. Right? Okay. So you have a picture in, in God's design and revelation of creation, the first foundational Hebrew word that capture human flourishing and design and desire is Shabbat, God resting. So great scholarship on Shabbat or rest is fundamentally not just passivity or the lack of work, not the antithetical, but the engagement of delight in relationship. Because to flourish is to be rightly related to God, to creation, and to others. And this is why Brian Fickert and others describe poverty as fundamentally a relational poverty, not just a material poverty. After that, you have, <clears throat> excuse me, the Tom Tamim word group, which is whole, wholeness, integralness. Very important idea through all of scripture being integral. And then you have Shalom later in 15. 
So let's just take shalom since it's the most common in those. Shalom has a sense, whether it's Jeremiah 29, shalom has an idea of a comprehensive sense of peace, of well-being, of wholeness, relationship vertical in Jewish context, horizontal and materially, right? God's well-being on humans. So whether we argue about exactly flourishing as an exact word, maybe it's like you mentioned, it's kind of like the Trinity, yeah, not, not to yeah. put it on the same level, yeah. but I mean, we don't exactly, I don't think, have a correspondence of an explicit Trinity word, mm -hmm. but the Trinity is all over the text. Mm -hmm. So we just say flourishing, as I understand it, comprehensive human flourishing that clearly finds its source in God, its redemption in God, its ultimate fulfillment in God, not in, not in a humanistic way that we're going to do it, is a foundational biblical category. And I think as you've mentioned, and you alluded to this earlier, the whole idea of the abundant life is another way of expressing the same That's kind of I idea. See. Yeah. So um, let me uh, see if there are any questions, and then uh, I'll also check the text here, which I haven't done, so let me, let me get organized. And uh, Lynn, go for it. Yeah. You're, you're just words. a what? <laughs> I'm just a Christian guy, so I'm just going to use English words. A, we don't know no Hebrew Christian. here, yeah, yeah. no Greek. <laughs> you know. This is a seminary. That's where I'm talking. Well, well welcome to the mic, Lynn. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, this is not you, my Darryl. Sunday morning conversation. In the couple of seasons in my life of ministry where I've yeah. had more direct relationship connection with the whole faith and work issue. One of the challenges, I mean, a lot of this yeah. comes out of me being on staff with InterVarsity Christian yeah. Fellowship for sure. a number of Great. years at different universities yeah. and being familiar with uh, Labrie, but also, uh, Good. you know, the reformers like um, Abraham Kuyper, Doyer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cornelius Van Til, and Institute for Christian Studies. I don't even know if they're still around in Toronto, Udo. Modelman, Brian Walsh, yeah. all yeah. of those various the transforming people, vision, yeah, more of that. That one of the things that was being attempted was to draw out, to tease out, in as significant a way as possible the intrinsic connection between any particular discipline or profession yeah. and spirituality. So you get up on Sunday morning or whenever <clears throat> teach the Bible, read the Bible, you do whatever, Bible, spiritual, and therefore preaching, teaching, spiritual, intrinsic connection. But I feel like the, the lack of that in our professional understanding in, in uh, faith and work has perpetuated this sacred-secular dichotomy. Now maybe you've already addressed that and I just didn't I just didn't catch it. But a lot of times it just seems to me we end up trying to spiritualize work by talking about doing all you do heartily as unto the Lord yeah. and having a Bible study right. at work and various ancillary things that are not actually intrinsic to the work and the discipline itself because I think in people's minds they are making this distinction. You know, whether it's right or wrong, they have yeah. this paradigm fixed in their head, and it takes a lot of work to get over that. So just wondering how it you... It takes a lot of work to understand work. No, right? I, I mean, I just, um, <laughs> I appreciate how informed you are, and um, I'm aware at some level of all the conversations you were talking about, the people that wrote in that area. Um, I just say a couple of things, and I know what Dr. Bach wants to say on that. This is why, to me, in conversations so we don't get to reinforce the sacred secular heresy, or primarily people to go out on Sunday afternoon, go to Monday work, think of it as a utilitarian function only. But I'm not minimizing the utility of it as it relates to the biblical text, which is we, wrote, we just wrote a book on the economics and every love, on loving our neighbor. Because there's a utility in our work that adds value to others, whether it's monetized or not, that I want to make a strong case for. I mean, it just, it's, we talk as Christians a lot about, rightly so, the one another's of scripture, a brotherly love and sisterly love, and that's important. We don't talk enough about neighborly love. So I'm, I'm not diminishing what you're saying. I'm saying, yes, there's a utility factor, particularly theologically, I think, tied to creation and to the Jesus teaching, Luke 10, uh, and the, the great commandment. However, that's why we need to have a constant 
diet of the biblical text that has a rich creation theology and biblical anthropology that sees work tied to the image of God as our very essence of who we are and what we're called to do. We just have to define work, avodah, and biblically, not English. Because most of us in English, work is what we get paid for. And I'm not diminishing that. You know, you talked about, when did you stop working? It's like, God designed us to work from cradle to grave, not to get paid for it. So I'm saying we have to have definition. But I would just go back to say, and, I, and I'll stop with Dr. Bach respond, helping people understand who they are made in the image of God, that they are made to contribute. And that cont contribution or that co-creation with culture has intrinsic value, not just utilitarian value. So again, the workplace is a place where I reflect God's image as well as love image bearers, as well as empowered by the Spirit, as well as love my neighbor through the value I bring in a global economy. So I, I agree with you. I would just say, I think part of it is not a rich creation theology that sees image bearing as intrinsic to who I am. And a vital part of that image bearing is not only relational connection, this is John Kilner's good work on dignity and destiny, but also um, reflection of God, that I reflect God as a co-creator, not, not, you know, from nothing, when you use that language, uh, ex nihilo, but that I'm working with him and honoring him in the very nature of what I do, that that has value. And but think, it is broken today and, still. And think about the importance of the That's idea of good service one. in Christianity. Who's the greatest among us? The one who serves. And then think about the core nature of work. Core nature of work is when, it, when it's profitable work, when it's beneficial work, is it serves. And it serves at a variety of levels. You know, um, the doctor serves in one way. Um, the accountant and a lawyer serves in another way. I, I like to joke about this. Even the guy who holds the sign saying stop and go on the highway, you know, who's controlling traffic while the road is being worked on, serves in another way. These acts of service are a reflection of the way in which God cares for us. That's intrinsic in the labor that we do. It's often that we lose sight of it. Um, I, I like to illustrate this. One of my favorite illustrations to bring this out is to say, what does it take, how many people did it take for you to have a bowl of Wheaties in the morning? Just think about that for a second, okay? <clears throat> And you can think about it from the grain level, you can think about it at the transport of the grain level, you can think about it at the processor level, you can think about the company that makes the boxes and the wrappers in the level, you can think about all the people who work at the grocery store. By the time you're done, it's like the end of a movie. All these credits are going by, all these different roles that people have played, okay, that you just take for granted. You don't even think about it. You just take for granted. Now, you're aware of the actor, you're aware of the director, the photography, that kind of thing in a movie, but there are a whole series of other categories. You know, yeah, what does that guy do? Yeah. You know, that, the, the jib operator, what is that guy? You know, and yet the way in which the film is presented to you in its photography is related mm -hmm. to the jib yeah. operator. So there is this intrinsic service in work that is a reflection of the way in which God has created the world and works for us. He works for us, you know. He's given us a place to live and he's given us the responsibility of stewarding it well. That's the intrinsic part of work. That's, and so when we talk about a theology of work and making people value their work and appreciate why, you know, thank God it's Monday, you know, that part of life. Um, that's, that's in the mix in terms of what we're talking about. So um, I think that's, I think those are two elements of what we're talking about. And the theology of work is rich, but we don't have a course on workology, so we don't think about it. Um, and yet it's there for us to reflect on. Let me take up some of the questions that have come over the, over the um, text here. Um, is there more to whole life discipleship than just teaching and preaching changes? Yes, there is. Uh, I mean, here's, here's the big shift. Based on theological conviction, if you are called to serve a 501c3 reality, church parachurch, that equipping people for the majority of their life involves clearly relational coaching, 
on marriage, relationships, all of that, rest, recreation. But since work, paid or unpaid, is such a central aspect, to really equip people in that world, knowing their world, then you have to enter their world. So yes, preaching changes, prayers change, uh, liturgies change on Sunday. You know they connect Sunday to Monday, you bring Monday back into Sunday. Because what you celebrate is what you value. Um, but you will uh, need to take a posture of epistemic humility. Because uh, many times as pastors or leaders, we are the experts when people come to our place of work. Can I use that language? Or mm -hmm. We're the experts in a certain area, and we should be. We're worth our salt. So we're experts on the Bible. Yeah, I mean, we should be. If yeah, we're not, yeah, yeah. we should be growing experts, right? Yeah, That's right. part of what we do. But we enter a whole range of God's callings in a congregation, plumber, CEO, stay-at-home spouse, retiree, and we want to enter their world. That means we enter with a posture of humility and curiosity and learn from them. This is why workplace visits things are so vital in a church for Monday. A church for Sunday and a church for Monday are very different creatures. And yet I wanna to suggest to you that God has called us to be a church for Monday. Okay, but that looks different, I'm just saying. And priorities, pastoral praxis, doesn't mean we don't preach well, we preach a bit different. We handle the text with integrity and depth, but we apply it, and the language we use changes. So language changes. For example, benediction changes. Can I say about this time tomorrow? Just an example. This time tomorrow is a liturgy that many churches are using around the country that affirms the priesthood of believers. I hope we all believe in that deeply. <laughs> And uh, we do preaching, singing, and, uh, but every now and then, like at Christ Community where I serve, and we're not on you know, the perfect church or anything, uh, but let's say once a month or a couple of months a month, we have a segment, a community life segment, called This Time Tomorrow. And This Time Tomorrow, there's graphics and all that sort of thing, and everybody knows about this moment, and the congregation is locked on. An individual in the congregation, asked ahead of time, comes up and is interviewed for five minutes by a clergy person, a paid person that serves the church in that workspace. And they ask him three questions. It's the most amazing thing for five minutes. Tell me, or tell us, where has God called you this time tomorrow? Notice the language. Mm -hmm. Maybe a stay-at-home spouse, changing diapers, in a pickup line, it might be running a company or anything in between. And we interview all kinds of people in their vocational hats, as you think about. Mm -hmm. Then they talk about their world. And everybody loves to talk about their world. Secondly, the second, second question is, what are the joys and challenges of being a follower of Jesus in that calling, right? It's Genesis 3 world. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes, lived out. And then lastly, how can we pray for you? And then often the clergy person or paid person will have people stand or raise their hand. They have a similar vocation, a similar this time tomorrow, and they participate in that liturgy by identif identification of God has called them, education, whatever. And then everybody stands and we pray. And the clergy person anoints and blesses and commissions this person for their Monday world. I have to tell you, there's no time in our corporate worship service, and we love singing, and I think the preaching is pretty decent most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good when my associate who's younger than me preaches, I'm telling you. <laughs> Sometimes I get to do a decent job. <laughs> but when we do this time tomorrow, I look around the congregation, the auditorium packed, everybody's locked on, nobody's on their cell phone. So again, that's just one example. 30 years ago, and I'm not saying we do it all right. I mean, we're not a perfect mm -hmm. church. But 30 years, I didn't have a theological conviction that led to liturgy and praxis that made that the normative of a gathered church service commissioning its people. See what I'm saying? And the result that's, is... It's just like, a, it's like day and night. And the result of the original model is, is that people feel disconnected when they come to church because some of their life is addressed, but some of their sure. life is left unaddressed. And, and we still commission missionaries. We're not devaluing the 501c3 world. We value that. But we also value other callings, and that's the difference. But people even newer to the congregation go, this, this church speaks my world. And then, intrinsically, we are saying the gospel we cherish, <laughs> that we love and build our life on, speaks to every part of my life. Right? And it's like, yeah, that makes sense to me. So anyway, I get a little teary, but it's like, yeah, so we can do this better with God's glory. Well, thank you yeah. for coming in yeah. and discussing this with yeah. us. Thank Tom yeah. for thank you guys. His time. Thank you.
Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, we know you are a wonderful God who created this world that we live in. You serve us. You serve us with the rain. You serve us with the grain. You serve us with the cross. And you ask us to image you. As we think about the ministry that we have, the preaching that we do, the teaching that we prepare for, uh, the ministry and discipleship that one day uh, we hope to lead, even if we're not leading it now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our prayer is that we might do so in a way that encourages people to see you in the whole of their lives, in every space and in every place, and that in that and through your spirit we might reflect your goodness, your care, your service, your work, your love for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.